I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work, as both of these are crucial to our success. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to our presenters, Stephanie Carroll and Jane Anderson, who have a lot of valuable things to share with us today. So, Stephanie. Thank you, Marcy. Welcome, everybody. And um, we're going to start by introducing ourselves since you can't see us. I'm Stephanie Carroll. Um, I'm Atma from the native village of Kudika and along the Copper River in Alaska. I'm an assistant professor of public health and associate director for the Native Nations Institute at the University of Arizona. And I'm also the chair of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, as well as the co-founder of the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network. And I'm here today with my good friend and colleague, Jane Anderson, who's gonna introduce herself briefly now. Hi everyone, my name is Jane Anderson. Uh, it's so great to have so many of you joining us. Uh, I'm an associate professor in um, Kent New York University and I'm the co-director of Local Context and the Equity for Indigenous Research and Innovation Coordinating Hub. Uh, it's great to have you all here, thanks. I think you may be muted. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to begin by acknowledging the Tanakam Nation on whose unceded land the University of Arizona is located and on which I now sit, and to their elders, elected, traditional, and emerging leaders, and to other respected persons of that nation. And I also pay my respects to the Pasco Yaki tribe, whose people also share these lands here in what is known as Tucson, Arizona. So today we're going to give you a brief introduction into some of the work that's happening both domestically here in the US as well as internationally around indigenous data sovereignty and governance. Um, we want to acknowledge that there are broad focus areas that address law, policy, ethics, and infrastructures. So um, you'll hear us give a nod to some of those other infrastructures, such uh, to some of those other elements, such as um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, federal and institutional guidelines, but we're going to really focus on some efforts around metadata standards um, in terms of infrastructures as, as well as notices, which will address some ethics aspects of implementing Indigenous data sovereignty and governance within repositories um, and other um, data collections. So indigenous peoples broadly are um, across the world um, and um, there is no one set definition. Um, defining indigenous peoples becomes a very broad conversation um, and um, often torpedoes are actual discussions of why rights are important for indigenous peoples and why, why self-identification is also um, elemental to um, how indigenous peoples identify themselves. So um, generally, indigenous peoples have a strong link to territories and surrounding natural resources, as well as distinct social, economic, and political systems. Um, and a connection to um, and uh, recognize the importance of reproducing their environments and systems as distinctive peoples and communities. So most importantly, indigenous peoples um, have inherent rights to sovereignty and self-determination. Here in the US, there are 574 federally recognized tribes, about 60 state recognized tribes, um, Native Hawaiian, um, as well as um, probably over 100 unrecognized tribes who are seeking federal or state recognition or acting as sovereigns. Um, and broadly, we apply indigenous data rights to all of those peoples. So what are indigenous data? Um, Data are information and knowledge in any format today that impact Indigenous peoples, nations, and communities at both the collective and, and individual levels. So these are data about our resources and environments. They are our land and water data, um, sacred sites, territories, plants, and animals. Also data about us as individuals. So administrative data, um, social health data, 
um, also those commercial and corporate data that are collected about us um, every second of the day. And finally, there are data about us as collectives, as nations and peoples. There are traditional cultural information. They are um, our oral histories, our literature, our ancestral and clans, not clan knowledges. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how we assert um, our rights and interests and govern um, these data through external systems today. Indigenous data sovereignty then is the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern those data. So to govern the collection, the ownership and application. This derives from inherent rights to govern people's lands and resources. Its genesis is in those traditions, roles and responsibilities that communities have had for generations um, to steward and care for community held information. We position indigenous data sovereignty within a human rights framework. We utilize court cases, treaties, and other recognitions, whether within domestic inter or international um, arenas as leverage points and as tools, but we're not dependent on those. Um, and finally, knowledge belongs to this collective and is fundamental to who indigenous peoples are as collectives. And so this is really about um, working through some of the epistemicide that's occurred and reclaiming um, and reasserting rights and interests within the data sphere. Importantly, um, data governance really interacts on a few levels. And so for indigenous peoples today who have experienced um, arenas of uh, data dependence where they're reliant on, for instance, the federal government for information about them, um, or for storing and caring for their information. Um, indigenous peoples are rebuilding their data system as well as rebuilding their governance system um, after uh, generations of settler colonial policies and practices which are still going on today. And so in that process, um, indigenous nations need data for governance. So they need that information to make decisions. So they need access today to um, COVID, um, numbers all from um, infection all the way up to wastewater treatments um, at the collective level or excuse me wastewater data about COVID at the collective level um, to make those decisions and at the set, same time they need to be making sure that the, these external governments and external entities like hospitals or um, universities have access to meaningful data about indigenous peoples that are um, created and collected and curated with their input. And then they need to be governing that data. And so um, it's an iterative process of, of um, governing and caring for data and stewarding and influencing how data are um, collected and how stored um, at the same time as they're impacting um, the collection of those data and the use of those data. And so there's a, there's a feedback loop and an um, ongoing interaction between the need for governance of data and the data and then data for governance. The reasons for this are because identifying indigenous collections and data are extremely difficult today, especially as we become more and more reliant on digital systems. So indigenous data and collections can be hard to find. They can be buried in larger collections, data sets, repositories, scientific papers. They are often mislabeled or not properly attributed. They're not searchable. So at a very base level, when we talk about research data, we say that an indigenous collections of data are not fair. They're not findable, they're not accessible, they're not interoperable, they're not reusable. And these data can range from ethnographic material to biological materials to earth observations and so on. So these data and information infrastructures pose challenges in an era of open data, big data, and open science. Every indigenous community has enormous collections and data held in archives, museums, libraries, repositories, and other online databases. But there's significant information about these collections, including individual and community names and proper provenance that is missing. Um, indigenous peoples and communities are largely not the legal rights holders to these data and collections. And there's issues of responsibility and ownership, as well as the incomplete and significant mistakes in the metadata. Um, that continue through the, the data life cycle today. And so there 
while we have these issues with existing data, there's also this um, landscape where there are more and more researchers working and collecting data and samples from indigenous communities than ever before. Um, and so beginning to um, insert indigenous data governance um, and using mechanisms for rights and interests within the data life cycles and ecosystems becomes more and more important. So these, these um, beginning to do that requires that tribal governance, governments govern tribal data, that they set up their own um, data systems um, and they begin to work through all the nuts and bolts of, of doing that. Um, that's not what we're focusing on today. Today we're focusing on enhancing these data relationships with data stewards um, who are external to tribes by managing by tribal standards. Um, and so we'll begin to show some tools of those in a little bit when Jane starts to talk. So across the globe, there's a commitment to indigenous data sovereignty. The terminology around indigenous data sovereignty and governance um, really came about about five years ago. And it is um, giving voice to efforts that have been going on for far longer than that, um, actually since contact and, and settler colonialism has occurred in many places. Um, within Indigenous data sovereignty, there are a number of networks. So I mentioned that I'm part of the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network here. There's um, the Tamana Roranga Maori Data Sovereignty Network in New Zealand, uh, as well as the Mayamnari Wingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective in Australia. There's a lot of efforts even broader than that. So um, the SAMI and um, in uh, Mexico and Latin America, in Southeast Asia and in India and elsewhere, and, and as well as Africa. So we're seeing a lot of activity beginning to occur. And um, so about a year ago, we formed the Global Indigenous Data Alliance to start to um, impact policy at the international level and network those nation state based networks or regional networks together so that we can begin to advance um, rights and interests of indigenous peoples. Um, and we've utilized the Research Data Alliance um, for uh, creating and, um, and beginning some of that policy and advocacy work at the international level. The Global Indigenous Data Alliance um, that promotes indigenous control of indigenous data. So I, like I said, it's an international network um, to advance indigenous data sovereignty and governance, um, particularly around um, asserting Indigenous people's rights and interests in data. Um, advocacy and policy is really where we're at, though most of us who participate in GITA are doing research in our own um, nation states as well as internationally around a lot of these aspects. Um, so most of our research and our policy advocacy reinforces these rights to engage in decision, in decision making about data in accordance with Indigenous values and collective interests. So um, when we formed GITA, we uh, released the care principles for indigenous data governance. These came from and were developed through a process at the Research Data Alliance um, through a workshop there on, um, to create those principles and then were vetted through um, Google Docs um, and um, paper documents through research and indigenous communities worldwide. Um, these principles were set forth to um, assert indigenous rights and interests within open data, open science um, and spheres, and to begin to influence uh, and set forth a minimum standard for how external entities interact with indigenous data and, digi and indigenous peoples. Um, so these, the care principles have four primary principles and each um, primary principle has three sub principles. And so we talk about collective benefit. So data, data ecosystems shall be designed and function in ways that enable indigenous peoples to derive benefit from the data, as well as authority to control, um, recognizing indigenous um, rights to control that data and working through some of the elements of, of data for governance and governance of data um, and putting forth that indigenous data governance enables um, indigenous peoples and governing bodies to determine um, how indigenous peoples, as well as indigenous lands, territories, resources, knowledges, and geographical indicators are represented and identified with, within data. Um, 
and all, as well as the R in care is responsibility. So those working with Indigenous data have a responsibility to share how those data are used and support Indigenous people's self-determination and collective benefits. So um, a lot of times when we talk about responsibility, we think about the responsibility to, to behave in a certain way and to do certain things, um, but also embedded with responsibility is the responsibility to build up and um, and participate in um, supporting the development of indigenous capacity, capability, and infrastructure. So building up and providing um, training in communities on not only the rights aspects, but the technical aspects or um, other aspects around um, uh, indigenous data practices within the in the indigenous nations, um, as well as building up the infrastructure. So, um, everything from making sure that there's internet con connectivity, but also the um, building up um, data repository or collections repository infrastructures and so on. And finally, ethics, grounding ethics in the, the ethics of communities in which you are working. So indigenous people's rights and well-being should be the primary concern in all stages of the data life cycle and the cost of data ecosystem. Um, importantly here, I think when we're thinking about repositories um, and or research today is really um, being committed and grounded in thinking through the impacts of future use of data um, and always um, being upfront um, about either the shortcomings of not of not having, for instance, you know, when when um, COVID research really started hitting the ground running, um, you know, when we even in the mainstream, we're not yet ready to deal through all of the privacy issues for individuals um, around COVID data, even in our consent forms. Um, but how do we deal through um, privacy and consent at collective levels so that we have um, indigenous rights and interests and indigenous peoples participating at all times and making those decisions about what data should be shared um, and how they're provisioned for reuse in the future. So once we set forth, or actually when we're producing the care principles for indigenous data governance, we knew that um, the immediate next steps were to think through the impact on policy and practice. Um, so how would entities be putting forth um, and, um, and aligning themselves with the care principles, what education needs would be needed for that, for policy development, but also the tools for practice within different spheres. And so uh, this is our, our initial thinking through um, as we begin to think about what operationalizing the care principles um, look like in different environments, about some of the tools that are already in hand um, for su supporting the care principles. So for instance, we have tribal um, research and data codes that exist in tribal law, tribal IRBs, um, and we have institutional guidelines. So at the University of Arizona and actually the state of Arizona, we have a tribal consultation policy um, that each of the universities are supposed to work through. And so um, tribes can, um, those are companion with tribes own research review processes. So tribes have some research review processes which are um, done by a, um, ind a independent board or they are completed by the tribal council through a tribal resolution, or they might have a tribal institutional review board, which is what an IRB is. Um, and those um, re re review research, um, sometimes just for humans um, and other times in a larger sphere. Um, and so today, what we're going to work through um, is um, talking about some of the ways that we can um, embed uh, provenance and indigenous rights and interests within uh, data repositories and um, our own through our own data collection by utilizing labels and notices, which Jane is going to speak to in depth. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Lenape and Lenape Hoking in New York, and I want to pay my respects to the ancestors as well as to the past, present, and emerging Lenape leaders. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the traditional knowledge and the biocultural labels and notices, which is a 
which are initiatives that come through a project called Local Context, which was established in 2010, with some primary uh, objectives of enhancing and legitimizing locally based decision making and Indigenous governance frameworks for determining ownership, access, and culturally appropriate conditions for sharing collections, historical collections, but also future collections and Indigenous data. Um, the local context ecosystem really exists of two different kinds of initiatives. Labels, which are developed by communities uh, and that communities are, are uh, in, in insert within to records and within to data, and notices, which were really developed for institutions and for researchers as a very different kind of um, uh, strategy to recognise Indigenous rights within data, um, within, within data systems. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the traditional knowledge labels or the TK labels, which really should be understand as, understood as cultural protocols for sharing knowledge. Um, they're machine readable, there's 18 of them, and they really bring Indigenous protocols into digital management of cultural heritage. Um, they're used by a lot of communities at the moment across multiple countries um, and have been around for a while. So they're kind of becoming more, um, uh, more embedded in the practices, not only within community levels, but also institutions and increasingly adopted by governments as well, uh, as they help governments meet certain kinds of standards around uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I'm going to talk through just a couple of the labels, uh, that just I think four of them. This is the attribution label. This really allows for communities to bring their names back into the record. Uh, a lot of those names have been excluded or are missing, and this is part of the challenge when a lot of this uh, cultural heritage gets digitised. Those names continue to be missing um, in the kind of in the metadata. So the attribution label does a lot of work to kind of correct and to include names that should have always been included from the beginning. Uh, and what you see here is the icon, which is uh, we see an icon and you see uh, text. And how the labels work is that the labels themselves themselves remain uh, static. You don't change the labels; they need to be recognised internationally partly because Indigenous communities have collections all around the world. Um, and what each community is able to do is to customise the text that goes with, uh, with the icon. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, in a moment. This is the outreach label. This is a label that allows communities to uh, decide on material that they would like and feel represents themselves. Again, dealing with a historical challenge that um, the ways in which Indigenous people have been represented hasn't been through Indigenous decision making. Um, it's largely been through non-Indigenous people who have chosen the ways in which Indigenous people are represented within our institutions. This is the seasonal label. This label is an interesting label in that it connects uh, land and place to knowledge. Uh, it recognises that there are certain kinds of times of the year that certain knowledge can be shared. Uh, and it allows the kind of expression of land-based teaching. So, for example, certain kinds of songs should only be sung at a certain time of the year, for instance, when the first snow occurs, or when harvesting sweetgrass, particular songs are sung, for example. This label allows for that kind of expression and that con context to come through in the record in a really, really different way. This is the culturally sensitive label. We recognise that within institutions there is an enormous amount of culturally sensitive material, not only uh, sacred, secret material, material that perhaps shouldn't have been recorded, and there's a lot of um, anxiety about the circulation of that material, but also material that, that has uh, cultural sensitivities around access to it. Uh, through and partly because of histories of colonialism, but also because of the ways in which Indigenous people have been studied and documented and the kind of the ways in which that representation has happened. So, for instance, communities use this culturally sensitive uh, label around census records when there's derogatory language around the census record from the Bureau of Indian Affairs agent, for example. Uh, other communities use this label around language materials, understanding that a lot of care and sensitivity needs to be uh, um, used around the circulation of those materials. So I want to just show you a couple of examples of uh, the labels in, in, in practice. 
Uh, the first one is an example with the Skolet Band of Stolo First Nation in Canada. And it's really about embedding digital cultural protocols into uh, a Skolet uh, project, uh, the virtual, uh, their virtual museum. Here is the kind of website for the Skolet Virtual Museum, and you can see at the top of their page, uh, they are using four labels that kind of govern the use of uh, content, help people understand what their responsibilities are when they're engaging with the stories that the Scarlets are sharing uh, with the world. This is an example of the customization of the labels. So you see that the icon remains the same, this is the attribution label. Uh, and this label has been customized by Scarlets to it, both into uh, the language, Hulkamalum, uh, but also uh, to kind of explain what attribution means to Scarlets. And here it means literally name and place. Every community is uh, able to uh, define the, those terms in their own ways, which really adds to, um, you know, explaining and nuancing the complexity around what we think attribution might be. Um, this is the Passamaquoddy tribe in the Library of Congress example. This is really an example about correcting metadata on existing records um, and establishing community authority. These recordings were made in 1890. They're the oldest sound recordings made on uh, indigenous lands in the United States. Uh, this was the online uh, catalog record at the Library of Congress prior to doing the work with Passamaquoddy. Uh, you can see that it's a fairly impoverished record in the sense that we know very little about the content. Uh, we have the researchers' names of the songs and we know the length of the sound cylinder. But other than that, we know very, very little about um, the recording and what's on it. Through working with the Passamaquoddy, uh, this is the updated uh, Library of Congress record where we have the name in Passamaquoddy there and there's uh, enormous pages of traditional knowledge that's being shared uh, with this one record. There are 31 uh, recordings and this is the same for all of them. But the Passamaquoddy decided they also wanted to use the traditional knowledge labels as a means for asserting their authority back into the Library of Congress record as well. And you can see them very close to the content uh, at the top of the page. Uh, they chose the attribution label, the outreach label, and the non-commercial label. So what had to, what had to happen with this was uh, there had to be some kind of transformations within the mark records. The labels are added as a, a different subfield within the mark record. But also uh, through this project, there was a need to actually develop within JSON the capacity for the traditional knowledge labels to be added to any record within the Library of Congress. And this is just an example of that. And one of the other interesting um, developments within this project was where do, do the patent quality rights get recognized? Uh, through ongoing conversations, it was decided um, that they needed to be expressed within the rights advisory. Uh, and you can see that they're expressed above the legal, the copyright holder, which is the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography at Harvard. They're being understood as the first rights. Uh, and so the labels are doing that kind of work as well to kind of bring in the recognition that should have been there from the first uh, moment. So uh, we've had been doing the TK labels for uh, about eight years and over the last year we started developing the new biocultural labels. Um, the biocultural labels really focus on accurate proven provenance, transparency and integrity in research engagements. And in this sense, they're really digital markers that define community expectations and consent about appropriate use of collections and data particularly trying to collect, connect data to people and environments over time. Um, and in that sense, they're really a practical application of Indigenous data governance principles to issues of access and benefit sharing for genetic resources. We have six biocultural labels, provenance, consent, verify, open collaboration, open to commercialization, multiple community and research use. So this is the, um, the text for why would you use the provenance label, kind of understanding that Indigenous people have the right to be making decisions about future use of information and biological collections, particularly in data and digital sequence information that derive from associated lands, waters and territories. 
And so this label is doing a lot of work to support the practice of proper and appropriate acknowledgement into the future, recognizing that many of the problems that the traditional knowledge labels have had to be trying to deal with is, the, is certain kinds of failures around appropriate and proper provenance within the record. So this label addresses that. The other intervention that we have are these uh, notices that we've developed, particularly for researchers and institutions. Um, this is the TK and BC notice and the uh, open to collaborate and attribution incomplete notices. They're not customizable in the same way as the, the labels are, but they really should be understood as kind of a placeholder that can be put on a collection or on data or in a sample field until the community has been able to add their labels to it. Um, the cultural institution labels uh, tend to work in a very kind of forward facing way in the sense that they help indicate to user publics that there are processes and protocols around collaboration that are occurring within the institution. And the TK and the BC notices tend to get used by researchers who are really at this kind of interface in engaging with Indigenous communities and want to, when they kind of uh, include their data within an institution, want to make very clear that there are Indigenous interests that need to be added in that first instance. So these are the, uh, the cultural institution notices that are open to collaborate and the attribution incomplete. And they really indicate a commitment to working with Indigenous communities to fix mistakes at the catalogue, classification and metadata level. This is an example of uh, those labels being used at the Abbey Museum. They have added them to their entire online collection. Uh, they've added the open to collaborate to all of their collection. Uh, and in many instances, they've added the attribution incomplete, recognizing that they don't have the full information about their, the item. And this is kind of an invitation to work collaboratively to make sure that that information going forward is included with that item. This is the New York State Museum has just added the, uh, the open to collaboration with their uh, Indigenous collections. This is the Lewis Henry Morgan collection. This is the largest collection of Native material is at the State Museum. Um, and again, kind of indicating uh, that there are actual proper processes in place to do that collaboration and to work with Indigenous communities. This is the notice that's been included within GEOME, which is a metadata database for geological and genetic sequences. Again, indicating that they're developing uh, metadata fields that can include traditional knowledge and biocultural labels. Hello again, everybody. At this time, we're going to take a pause um, and give everybody a little time to reflect and think through some questions that we're posing here. Um, and then we'll move on and have our final brief discussion about uh, future ideas and efforts here. So first, we'd like your feedback on um, Indigenous data sovereignty and the tools we've presented that support Indigenous data sovereignty. And you see the questions here. We're going to have someone pop up. It's in the chat now. There's a poll where you can give feedback on, would you like your institution to have further training on IDSAV and the labels? Um, and as well as a second question there, so. Yeah, so hi everybody, this is Marilee. Um, we have a, uh, um, a, uh, an interactive poll here that we'd like to invite you um, to participate in. Um, and, uh, Unfortunately, I didn't change this to give a count. We just see that 100% of people of respondents. Um, uh, so if you open a tab on your browser and go to pollev.com um, slash OCLC, uh, we can, uh, we're inviting you to indicate if you're um, interested in being more engaged. And then uh, in just a moment, we will um, share with you a link where you can actually um, sign up and indicate your interest. So uh, there are some additional steps that you can take um, to uh, sign on to get some more information in um, the two areas that uh, were indicated, um, or you can just, uh, uh, you know, this this webinar may be, may be enough for you for right now, but we're seeing kind of uh, overwhelming interest here um, in, uh, 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 in um, uh, finding out more. 
So I am going to um, leave this poll open for a moment, but but don't go away from this um, uh, URL. We're going to uh, uh, we're going to um, uh, be back with another poll in in just a just a few minutes. Um, so uh, let's switch back over uh, to the slides. Marilee, did you ask the same question or the second question on that poll as well? Or are we doing that next? A little glitch in the system here. Stephanie, you can go on to the next slide and we'll grab people's information um, from the form. Okay, so the if you are interested in further connections, both um, to learn more or for train the trainer opportunities, uh, there is a Google survey that you can complete. The link is now in the chat box, um, and that will give you direct um, contact without having to further um, do anything right now to indicate your interest. Um, and so please take a moment to do that. Yeah, so now we have uh, another um, another interactive session. So if you go back to that um, same URL, uh, pollev.com uh, slash OCLC, uh, we're interested in finding out from you, so I'm going to switch over to my, my screen, which particular aspects of this would you be most interested in learning more about? Um, so you should have a little text box available and you can um, type in some text. Uh, as soon as we start seeing responses, they will be um, displayed here uh, on the screen. And then you can, um, you can upvote uh, any, um, there we go. We see that uh, uh, there's interest in learning more about those uh, TK and BC labels, um, applying culturally sensitive labels to MARC records or Dublin Core records in our catalog and digital repository. Also some interest in that particular um, application metadata just more generally. Uh, how the TK and BC labels can be effectively used in repository records. Yes, I know that in talking to some people, um, uh, materials in the institutional repository are frequently um, uh, come up as uh, areas where people are interested in informing uh, future researchers about how that data can be used. Um, permitting different user groups the options of seeing labels based on their preferences. This is like a little horse race. Um, I am going to, I'm going to um, suggest that in the interest of time, we, wow, look at these, look at these go. Uh, we switch back. I'm going to leave the poll open, though, so people can continue to enter information in here. And maybe at the end of the presentation, um, we can come back and look at this uh, some more and see how this is shaped up. But I think this is fabulous input um, for, for you guys. Uh, does that work well for you guys? That works great. Thank you for managing that. And thank you, everybody, for answering that poll. Um, it is fun to watch it become populated. So we're going to switch and talk about opportunities for Indigenous futures and applying um, and thinking through um, some initial uses and kind of spurring thoughts about what some further uses of um, the two items that we talked about today are. So the notices and the labels um, from a, a high level perspective. So uh, one of the things that we are just initially beginning conversations are our research repositories, um, particularly those within university settings. And so thinking through with those um, repository managers and others who are creating the systems for those repositories, what are the issues around tribal um, data within um, research repositories? So some of the questions initially I've had from some repositories um, folks are, you know, are tribal identifiers sensitive data? Um, 
how would you implement labels and notices within um, those systems if you want to be able to to um, to utilize and, and store um, tribal data within those systems. And so some of the feedback initially is that there have been um, statements within the US um, and by indigenous data sovereignty, but also by tribes and um, um, intertribal organizations. So the National Congress of American Indians um, made a statement, actually put some um, words into NIH around some of their repository data sharing um, policies stating that restrictions should be operative anytime that the data do include information from American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and individuals. So um, the recommendation is to include a policy statement or um, we would argue to even make stronger statements through notices and other items that researchers must um, document how they are respecting the preferences of tribal nations to share or not share data. So um, the, the repository itself can um, include uh, elements of this. And so um, one thing that you can do within a repository, for instance, is in the metadata have a tick box um, if there and request that researchers indicate if there is indigenous data within their data that they're depositing. And also if, um, if there is, they need to append or submit um, the tribal permissioning for that. So whether it was a um, tribal resolution or a um, uh, uh, an institutional review board um, approval that states how those data may be shared, but to put that in the uh, repository themselves. Um, of course, we want to acknowledge that there's challenges in this about how do you deal with um, data that might be aggregated for indigenous or American Indian or Alaska Native status. So use that kind of um, um, uh, variable instead of using a tribal identifier variable. Um, and so what levels of protection need to be there for those data um, in, uh, as opposed to data that may um, indicate that I'm Atna from the native village of Kulika, for instance. Um, and so, um, you know, those are just emerging and working through both at the NIH and also um, in other research funder and arenas as well as in uh, the repository arena itself. Um, and then stating that metadata must collect whether data sets contain indigenous data. So that's part of the tip box aspect um, and asking researchers to describe how those data were obtained and documented. So working through some of the, um, the attribution and provenance issues. Um, and so um, again, finally collecting those permissions from a repository standpoint um, not just having a tick box in there. Um, and these, like I said, are very initial conversations that um, myself and some others have had um, with rep research repositories at universities about applying what needs to accompany applying labels and notices within the policies and, and systems themselves. Um, and then Jane right now is going to talk to you about a, talk to you about a couple other efforts that we have moving forward with the labels and notices. So thinking about these kinds of like who are the kind of key um, stakeholders that need to be engaged with this work, as, as Stephanie mentioned, repositories are core, um, funders are core, but so too are researchers and publishers. So we've uh, initiated some conversations with the Nature Publishing Group, who's very interested in thinking about using the biocultural labels and the um, TK and BC notices to support kind of integrity and um, transparency in research. Uh, this is something that is really important, not only through uh, to be made visible to uh, you know, researcher publics, but also understanding what the contours of research have been and mean when you're doing engaged and supported research. So this is kind of one conversation that's happening with nature at the moment. And this is another conversation that's happening with ORCID, um, which is uh, a, a not-for-profit not that is, again, thinking about how to create transparency around research. Uh, they're very interested in how the notices can be applied within their research records or within individual researcher records, indicating that um, 
researchers are aware that they're working with communities, as well as thinking about what the metadata for those uh, for that research looks like. And part of the work that we're doing at the moment is building out uh, the new local context hub that will deliver the TK and the BC labels, but it will include um, the capacity for ORCID numbers to be included with notices that are then distributed. One of the other efforts that we're currently working through is through the IEEE, um, who sets a lot of data standards uh, we are working to set up a recommended practice for the provenance of Indigenous people's data. This effort actually just launched um, late last month, and we're due soon to have our, new, our next meeting next week. And so this is a, um, an, an effort really to um, create a very broad um, and high level um, recommended practice for the core parameters for providing and digitally embedding provenance information for Indigenous people's data broadly. Um, and so um, through the IEEE, this process takes about four years to get a standard um, set. Um, and um, we welcome anybody to just um, email you. Actually, you can email me for more information if you're interested in joining that. I know a couple of folks who are on this call have done have already attended a meeting. Um, and we look forward to doing that. It's going to be an, um, an interesting process. And so that's all that Jane and I have for you today. Um, we know it was very quick and, and um, a fast overview. And so um, we do have some time now to engage um, through um, some questions and to answer those and also do contact us and look through some of the links that were in the chat box as well as um, that are on the slides now. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Jane. Um, you've given us a lot to think about, some really valuable information. We do have time for a few questions, so uh, we can start with those that have come in through chat already. Uh, so, uh, one of the questions is, how are the CARE principles related to the SAA, Society of American Archivists, protocols for Native American archival materials? I'll take that one quickly, and then Jane, if you want to add on to that. But I just say broadly, so um, in terms of timeline, the CARE principles came after those. Um, but um, the CARE principles are more broad. So they apply across all spheres. Um, and so they, we've set them forth as a minimum standard set forth through an iterative process, primarily with indigenous peoples to, um, uh, to create some very baseline guidelines. And so um, our hope is that uh, all of these societies and others will begin to uh, start to think through um, you know, whether their guidelines um, are um, aligned with the care principles or what the care principles actually, um, uh, or what the care principles might push the, their um, uh, discipline guidelines to consider, um, or actually in other ways, how their discipline guidelines can the expectations or already do exceed the expectations of the care principles. So again, yes, care principles very broad for lots of disciplines um, and um, the SAA are, are specific to um, uh, archivists. Thanks, Stephanie. I think that uh, that takes care of that, and we can move on to another question, which is, is there an attempt to distinguish the label used within an indigenous group and the label that same group uses for outsiders? No. The answer, I guess the short answer is no. Um, what we find is that communities are really using these labels for outsiders. Um, they're really expressions that are for a different kind, for a, for a non-Indigenous public, particularly within repositories or particularly with engagements with researchers. Um, some communities do use them within their own content management system to help um, navigate through particular kinds of content, and they use the same labels that they would be using as for a public uh, outward facing as for internal, but they really were developed to um, help educate 
non-Indigenous publics about already existing cultural protocols that should have always been considered as part of how that material is being reused, regardless of who holds the legal rights. Great. Thanks so much for, for that, Jane. Um, and then another question. Um, so someone wrote in to say they're curious uh, if if thought has been given towards permanent links or URIs for the TK labels, this would make embedding the labels in holding repository records more effective and allow repositories to link back to the latest and most preferred version of that yeah. label. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the TK labels do have that. They do have a permanent URI um, that goes with them uh, when they're developed through the TK label hub. Um, and that will be the same for the biocultural labels as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And then uh, another question about the TK labels. Are they accessible by screen readers? In terms of accessibility and uh, those who need to use, uh, you know, screen readers for visual impairments? Right. At, at the moment, they're not. It's one of our um, access issues that we're dealing with um, so that they can be available and uh, can be seen by screen readers. Uh, so yes, yeah, we're working on that. Well, there's there are there's a, there's a lot of work to do. So it's good to know that that's on um, the list of items to be working on. Um, and you know, uh, Stephanie and Jane, if there's interest, uh, Marilee could show the, uh, the the final results in the poll. If we want to just take a look at that and share that uh, with one another, now uh, we could we could do that. All right, so Marilee, I will hand things over to you and uh, have you show us uh, what things are looking like. Um, and Marilee, I might have you verbal. Yep. Uh, yeah, yep. Sorry. Uh, when, when I was sharing, <laughs> yeah, when I was sharing my screen, I was having problems unmuting myself because that option went someplace else. Um, so there's uh, a lot of interest in that kind of practical application here, um, uh, applying the um, the labels within um, Mark records or Dublin Core records for the digital repository. Uh, and also um, some more kind of uh, an opportunity to learn more about the uh, how the labels work in depth um, and to see more examples. Um, you shared some examples, but I think that there's a real hunger to see uh, how these uh, play out in um, in library systems, um, in finding aids, etc. Um, again, uh, that. Uh, uh, interplay with repositories, and I think I saw a little bit further down the list, working with researchers who may be generating data. Um, you talked a little bit about that. Uh, your work with ORCID, I think, would definitely um, apply there. So just a, a really um, broad uh, range of things that people are interested in um, digging into a little more. So uh, we will definitely, um, Karen asks if we will share these poll results, we definitely will. Um, I will uh, take a, um, a screenshot of these and uh, share them back both with our presenters and then also uh, we can post those along with the other materials. Um, on our I, I do see in here yep. a, a question, maybe we can ask uh, Jane and Stephanie while we've got them, is how are creation and updates to TK labels documented? So, you know, 20 years out, will communities be able to trace the evolution of their labels? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, through the local context hub that we're building, we have a database that um, uh, maintains the um, legacy of the labels as they're being created, so that it's not only in 20 years will you be able to see, um, you know, how these have been, you know, rewritten or kind of how they've transformed um, as Indigenous communities' needs have transformed, but also they will that will serve as a, um, a great base for us to be able to use. Um, machine learning uh, technology to help find and search for labels across repositories as well. So, so that database is pretty important and pretty key to the hub that we're developing. Excellent. That's excellent to hear. Um, and then another question. Can you link to where the tribal-specific TK label URIs can be found? Um, and that's something we can, if you don't have that handy, we can share it uh, afterwards. And then, uh, let's see, do you see applications for the care principles outside of Indigenous data? 
Uh, so in other words, thinking about the overall principles when considering research done with other populations who may not have the same types of organized governance as indigenous communities. Curious about your thoughts for that. Yes, so I will say, this is Stephanie, I will say um, there is a definite yes there. Um, when we released the care principles, well, I'll back up a little bit. When we first started talking about indigenous rights and, and um, open data uh, broadly internationally, um, there was a lot of chatter about how it might, how those rights um, and the, the mechanisms and tools that come out of asserting those rights might impact and um, benefit other marginalized communities. Um, fast forward to when we released the care principles about a year ago, um, almost immediately there was a lot of response about, well, these can apply to everybody. Um, and one of the real, um, uh, you know, in two ways. One is that, you know, we really need to be thinking hard about our data governance systems um, more broadly. Um, and then two, um, the care principles set forth all of uh, these ideas to think about about that apply to people and purpose of data, which I, I didn't really address that well. And what I talked about is that they, you know, they, they're companion to the to the fair principles, right? And so the fair principles are um, thinking about the attributes of data, but the care principles are really setting forth minimum standards to to apply within um, people and purpose. And so um, there is one huge caveat to this, though, is that we've pushed back on these um, broad applications of the care principles are that these care principles came out of indigenous innovation and indigenous values and um, indigenous rights and interests. And so if we wholesale just take them into a mainstream application right now without letting um, the innovation and um, and creation continue to occur through um, indigenous values and indigenous ways of knowing, um, then we won't, indigenous peoples or the rest of the world, benefit from um, that thinking in the tools and the criteria and the operationalization of the care principles. Um, and so um, we've kind of pushed back a little bit in terms of working with people to apply them outside the, um, the indigenous context for now. Thank you, Stephanie, for so eloquently describing that and um, I, just thinking about people and purpose, but also the value of indigenous ways of knowing. So 